Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. On behalf of the partners and teams of Understanding Ag and Soil Health Academy, we want to welcome you here for this important webinar by Dr. Stephanie Seneff entitled Toxic Legacy. Dr. Seneff will be presenting and then uh, during the presentation, you can type your questions into the question box. And at the end, we will, we will get through as many of those questions as possible. Dr. Seneff is a senior research scientist at MIT's a computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She has a bachelor's degree from MIT in biology and a master's degree, engineer's degree, and PhD degree, all from MIT in electrical engineering and computer science. Her recent interests have focused on the role of toxic chemicals and micronutrient deficiencies in health and disease with special emphasis on the herbicide glyphosate and the mineral sulfur. I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Seneff a number of years ago, and it really sent me on a path of learning uh, the ramifications of everything I do on my farm and ranch. And our goal at Understanding Ag is to do just that. We believe we as farmers and ranchers need to understand all that we do. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Stephanie Seneff. Thank you so much uh, for having me here. And I hope that uh, this will be informative for many of you who may not know about the um, extensiveness of glyphosate's toxicity to human health and to the environment. And so let me go ahead and share my screen and get this started. So the title of my talk is Toxic Legacy, How the Weed Killer Glyphosate is Destroying Our Health and the Environment. And that is also the topic, the title of the book that I have written on glyphosate that will be available for, um, to, to, to buy uh, July 1st, starting July 1st this year. Start, start with a little joke just to get the right environment here. And then a quote, the earth is not dying, it is being killed, and those who are killing it have names and addresses. And this is the late activist musician, Utah Phillips. And then I want to bring up this book, Silent Spring, because this book was important for me. I read it when I was maybe 14 years old, back when it first came out, um, and it made a profound impression on me. And of course, it was all about DDT, and uh, she showed very systematically how the birds were being hurt by the DDT, and we were losing um, so many important um, species uh, due to this poison that was pervasive in our environment at that time. And uh, she really did uh, start us on this path of thinking about these chemicals not being, um, we cannot be using these chemicals indiscriminately without uh, tremendous cost. Um, so this is an outline of my talk and it's gonna be a lot about uh, health and, and disease, uh, starting with an introduction and then uh, glyphosate evidence of persistence and toxicity a section on animal and human diseases, uh, glyphosate in the gut. Now people may know that the gut microbiome is being hit hard by glyphosate. And I think that we've had so much uh, interest lately in the uh, topic of gut dysbiosis and how it's linked to many other diseases. I will have a section specifically on autism. And that was where I started because I was really interested in understanding why the autism rates were going up back in around 2006, 2007 timeframe. And that's when I started switching over my research from computer science into this sort of health and disease um, topic. And I've, um, I spent five years looking before I found glyphosate fortuitously, just from an accidental uh, event where I, I heard about this guy, Don Huber, Professor Don Huber was talking, giving a two hour presentation on glyphosate. And at that time, that was in 2012, I hadn't, I hadn't um, known what glyphosate was up to that point, I'm embarrassed to admit, but now I sort of think about it every day. So glyphosate and autism, glyphosate and endocrine disruption, which is something that's becoming very clear in the last few years, <clears throat> something that they did not, weren't aware of back in the early days. And then a short section on transgenerational effects. When the mother is exposed to glyphosate, when the fetus is in utero, it has long-term effects on the offspring, even going down multiple generations. And then finally, how to stay healthy in a toxic world, and then a conclusion. So introduction, um, 
I'm sure you all know what glyphosate is, uh, Roundup, spraying the dandelions in the yard, spraying the fields and crops, um, Roundup ready uh, crops, corn, soy, canola, sugar beets, cotton, tobacco, and alfalfa. These are all sprayed routinely without dying because they've been engineered to resist it. And then others don't, uh, don't uh, people aren't as aware that it's also being sprayed on many crops that are not GMO crops right before harvest as a desiccant. And that includes wheat, oats, barley, rye, sugarcane, beans, lentils, peas, flax, sunflowers, pulses, and chickpeas, and maybe others, but that's, those are the ones I was able to identify. So a brief history of glyphosate, it's now the number one herbicide in use in the United States. It's been increasingly used around the world, and it's the number one herbicide used in the world, uh, patented by Monsanto as an herbicide, in 1969, so it goes back several decades. Um, it was first introduced into the US food chain in 1974, but in the beginning, it wasn't, it wasn't used that much. It wasn't until um, they came up with the GMO Roundup Ready crops that the use started to go up dramatically. Um, it came out from under patent in 2000. At that point, it became cheaper and, many, and it was spread much more readily around the world. Other countries started using a lot more than they had been before. It's, it's a mechanism of toxicity is believed to be the uh, in inhibition of an enzyme that's in a biological pathway called the shikimate pathway, which is a critical pathway in, in all plants, but is not found in human cells. And this is why it's argued to be safe for us. Uh, that pathway produces uh, tyrosine, tryptophan, and phenylalanine, which are the three aromatic amino acids. And those are three of the 20 or so amino acids that are the building blocks of proteins. Um, so it was a huge expansion of these GMO corn, soy, cotton, and canola crops that started in around 2000 that led to sharp increases over the past two decades. So is glyphosate non-toxic? Monsanto has argued that it's harmless to us because our cells don't have this biological pathway, but our gut mi microbes do have the pathway and they use it. They use that pathway to produce these essential amino acids, among other things, uh, precursors to many important biologically active molecules that will be deficient if these microbes can't produce those, uh, can't use that pathway. So we end up uh, in stress because of what's happening to our gut microbiome. <clears throat> Other ingredients in Roundup uh, greatly increase glyphosate's toxic effects. And this is something that's been shown in multiple papers that have come out, particularly out of a group uh, in France uh, led by Professor Seralini. Um, so I think an important thing about glyphosate is that its effects are slow and insidious. And so when you look over a short time period, you don't really see necessarily any problem and you think the chemical is safe. You need to look longer in order to see the damage. However, and you know, they've been claiming that it doesn't cause cancer, but recently there have been three successful lawsuits uh, which, which you know, were won with a jury trial based on the idea that glyphosate caused the, the uh, suitors, the people's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that has brought a lot of awareness to the population of the possibility of glyphosate causing cancer. So why didn't we find this out long ago? I think there's a number of reasons. Um, back in the day when they were trying to get glyphosate approved, which was in the 1960s, they defined some rules for evaluating toxicity. And one thing was that it was okay to evaluate its toxic effects in isolation, even though when you used it on the farm, you had mixed it into a formulation that had other things added to it, which could be toxic in and of themselves, and also which would enhance the uh, active ingredients toxic chemical, toxic activity. So this was overlooked in the evaluation. Um, another thing was they, they argued that if high levels appear safe, then you don't need to study lower levels, in levels that are any lower than that. Uh, this mantra, the dose makes the poison, that turns out not to be true for um, endocrine disruptors. And we, we are seeing now that glyphosate is an endocrine disruptor. It is more toxic at extremely low levels than it is at higher levels. And then they also said no need to study beyond three months because if you don't see toxicity by three months, you know, it's fine. But uh, studies have shown that you need to look more than three months to see some of the effects that glyphosate can cause. It's a slow kill. And so its effects accumulate, it accumulates in the body over time and that makes it become uh, more, as you continue to be exposed, uh, you get sicker and sicker or slowly over time. And many studies that are coming out in the past few years have shown diverse uh, adverse consequences of low dose exposures, even transgenerational. And I will talk about those in more detail later in this talk. So evidence of persistence and toxicity. This is the shikimate pathway. Uh, if you can see my mouse here, um, a, a number of steps that finally get to this molecule chorismate, which is a precursor to a whole bunch of things down here, all of which are important biologically. This is in the plants, but also in the microbes. And um, this is from Robin Minaj's paper of 2021. 
And you can see that glyphosate blocks right here, this EPSP synthase. Uh, and so you don't get any, you, you get a reduced amount of chorismate, which means that all of these things become deficient. Tyrosine, phenyl, and tryptophan, those are the three aromatic amino acids. This is vitamin K2. This is a coenzyme Q10, which is an essential, uh, uh, plays an essential role in the uh, mitochondria to, to produce ATP. And then this is, for example, some important biologically active molecules that are produced by plants that protect. They're very healthy for us to take as protection antioxidant defenses. So all of them are going to be problematic with this blockage of that pathway. Uh, so here's a paper from 2021. And I want to say a lot of papers are coming out very recently about glyphosate, which is encouraging. People are really starting to study it much more than they were before because they're becoming aware that it is toxic. So this was looking specifically at this enzyme in the chicken mate pathway and looking at the sensitivity of organisms in the gut. And they, they did this bioinformatics version uh, study and they concluded that about 54% of the species in our core human gut microbiome would be sensitive to glyphosate. So that's gonna be a pretty tremendous effect on our gut microbiome. So here's this, again, the shikimate pathway, these gut microbes, shikimate goes to chorismate, chorismate goes to all these things. And in fact, there's the vitamin K. These are the three aromatic amino acids. Those are precursors to all of these things. Dopamine, adrenaline, serotonin, melatonin, melanin, and thyroid hormone. These are all really, really important hormones um, that are controlling a great deal of uh, the policy in the body's the metabolic system. And vitamin K2, of course, is also very important for the blood and other reasons. And then several B vitamins also come out of this pathway too. So they become deficient as well. And there's your glyphosate blocking that. So uh, this was a study from 2014, uh, quite a striking quote in this study that I would like to just read. It's commonly believed that Roundup is among the safest pesticides. Despite its reputation, Roundup was by far the most toxic among the herbicides and insecticides tested. This inconsistency between scientific and fact and industrial claim may be attributed to huge economic interests, which have been found to falsify health risk assessments and delay health policy decisions. So that's quite a strong statement by the authors of this paper. Um, so, this is a, so this is a paper that I wrote together with Anthony Samsel, published in 2013. And we identified the main, what we thought were the main toxic effects of glyphosate, uh, really uh, pointing to the gut microbiome as being very sensitive and to causing gut dysbiosis when glyphosate, even they're chronically exposed to glyphosate, beneficial bacteria get killed off, pathogens are allowed to overgrow, and you get inflammatory gut, you get bowel um, constipation and diarrhea and bloating, all kinds of gut issues that eventually lead to other more serious diseases. Uh, it interferes with a, a, a critical, critical enzyme class in the, uh, in the liver called cytochrome P450 enzymes. There are many, many of these enzymes, not just in the liver, but it was studied on mice and it was shown that it disrupted the uh, activity of these enzymes. And these enzymes uh, perform many, many important functions in the body, including making the bile acids, activating vitamin D, and detoxifying many toxic chemicals, including drugs, breaking down prescription drugs. So all of these things are gonna be affected by the suppression of the site enzymes. <clears throat> it also, uh, glyphosate is a very important uh, chelator. It binds to minerals, particularly plus two cations like cobalt, manganese, zinc, iron, uh, magnesium, uh, many of these you know, critical uh, micronutrients. Uh, that we need in only small amounts, but they're very important for catalyzing many of our enzymes. So glyphosate, uh, by binding to them, makes it them unavailable, starting to the gut microbiome. And some of those microbes are very sensitive to deficiencies in minerals like um, manganese. Uh, it interferes with the synthesis of the aromatic amino acids, as I've said that before, and also of methionine, which is the base of the sulfur-containing amino acids. It turns out glyphosate uh, disrupts the sulfur pathways very badly, and I talk a lot about that in my book, the, the science is rather complex. Uh, so it disrupts sulfate synthesis and also sulfate transport, um, sulfate activation, su sulfate transfer from one molecule to another. All of that is getting disrupted uh, by glyphosate uh, if, uh, as I see it. <clears throat> so this is a chart over time of glyphosate usage. Um, that's the blue line. And the red line is, um, is the emergence of glyphosate resistant crops among the glyphosate resistant weeds among the GMO crops. And so they had argued that, you know, that these GMO crops would cause you to, the farmers to use less herbicide and it would be a, a benefit, uh, a health benefit. But in, what turned out to happen is that as these weeds became resistant, they had to increase the amount of dosage that they put onto the crops in order to kill the weeds. And so you get this um, 
dramatic rise in glyphosate usage over time, uh, the opposite of what they were claiming would happen. And of course, glyphosate is also uh, messing up the soil. So it messes up the gut microbiome and also messes up the soil microbiome. And that disrupts the uptake of a lot of uh, minerals into the plants, which means that the foods you eat are, are deficient. And this includes sulfur as well as these other minerals that I mentioned before, cobalt and zinc and iron and whatnot. They all become deficient in the crop when the crop is exposed to glyphosate because it interferes with their absorption uh, in the roots. Now, this is a new paper, uh, 2021 which I found really fascinating. Glyphosate accumulates in biofilms. Very, very important paper, I believe. And what they found was they, they, they experimented with uh, what happens when glyphosate is, is added to um, waterways that have a lot of growth inside them, these sort of biofilms where there's a lot of um, natural um, biomass. And what happens is that the glyphosate actually zips into that biomass and disappears from the, from the liquid water from the remaining water. So it looks as if the, the glyphosate has been removed, but it has not. What's happened is it has concentrated at much higher levels in those biofilms, two to four orders of magnitude higher levels than in the surrounding water. And so uh, the fact that the idea that it's disappearing is an illusion. And then, so they say that these juvenile fish and these amphibians that are living in the biofilm are gonna be very highly exposed to glyphosate under those circumstances. So a quote from that paper, we may be under recognizing the potential ecological risk of contaminants like glyphosate that are bioconcentrating in biofilms and subsequently being consumed. And of course, this is gonna go up the food chain too. Uh, this is another very recent paper, 2021, glyphosate remains in forest plant tissues for a decade or more. And I found that quite surprising. We've been told that it disappears very quickly, it breaks down and it becomes harmless after even a couple of weeks. But in certain cases, that's not true. And in fact, what happens with these forests, this is they use a lot of glyphosate in the forests up in Canada. And they were looking at the residues in trees that had been sprayed many, many years before. And they found in some tissue types that it was still present after 12 years, uh, at, at when it had been ex exposed 12 years previously. And uh, the roots tended to retain more glyphosate uh, longer, more glyphosate longer than the shoots, shoots in the tissues. And they found that the colder areas up north, further up north, were, had, were slower to lose their glyphosate than the areas that had uh, a warmer client climate. Um, this is a paper from 1983, and it's not, it's unpublished. It's an unpublished document that Monsanto had commissioned, a study that Monsanto had commissioned. Anthony Samsel obtained it through the through FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act from the government. And this paper is quite striking because they took radio labeled glyphosate and they injected it into the uh, peritoneum of these mice, of mice. And then they followed what the radio label to see where it went. And in particular, they found uh, glyphosate it reached the bone marrow at levels of 340 parts per million after just one half hour. And then it stayed there at about that level for the entire duration of the experiment, which was for 10 hours. So it goes into the bone marrow and it stays there. And this is really critical because you think about the stem cells in the bone marrow that are precursors to the, uh, blood, the blood cells, the, um, the lymphocytes and the, um, the blood cells that are associated with cancer. And so I suspect that this accumulation in the bone marrow is connected to the fact that glyphosate has been shown to cause non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it, finally, we are getting really big success. A few years back, that I was very excited when that first case, um, Lee Harvey, Lee, <laughs> uh, I forgot his name, sorry. Anyway, the first case was really exciting when he <clears throat> won the case with a jury for a significant amount of money. Um, on, the, on the basis of glyphosate causing his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that was followed by a second case and a third case. The third case involved a couple and all four of them got large re uh, rewards from a jury trial. These, all these cases were still in negotiation. <coughs> so now because of that, many, many other people are coming up with their non-Hodgkin's lymphoma claiming that glyphosate caused it. We've got like, here's 125,000 cases in the United States of lawsuits uh, against Roundup, arguing that Roundup caused their disease. And Bayer's been trying to work out a deal to pay something like $11 billion. Uh, I think it's still in negotiation, but this Bayer would like to get this settled and they'd like to get it settled in such a way that they're off the hook for future cases. And that's where the snag is because the lawyers are refusing to allow that to happen. Animal and human diseases. This was a, a very famous uh, controversial study that came out originally in 2012, and then pressure from the industry caused it to get retracted, and then it was republished in 2014 in this journal, Environmental Sciences Europe. 
um, a fascinating study. And this was actually the study that I, after I heard the talk by Don Huber, I went back and found this paper. And that's what really convinced me that Don Huber was on to something with this chemical. So I continued to explore, uh, do the research to figure out the bigger story. So they, and what they did was they, they, they violated two rules of the studies that had been done in the 1960s. They extended the study beyond the three months and they used low dose glyphosate in their study. The dosage was you know, below the regulatory limits, but the rats were exposed throughout their lifespan to this, to this uh, roundup. And then they observed uh, their, the evidence of harm. And after three months, they were looking okay. They couldn't really tell any difference between the control group and the treatment group. But by the time they finished, it was four months, they started to see problems. And by the end of their lifespan, they had a number of different issues. And these, these mammary tumors are, are one of them this, in the females. But they also had, the males had a significant uh, risk of liver and kidney disease. Sex hormones were disrupted for both the males and the females. There was a lot of oxidative stress. And, um, and the effects were uh, not apparent at, until after four months. And they also had a shortened lifespan. So this was actually a very important study because I think after this point in time, 2014, you started to see new papers coming out looking at low dose glyphosate. Before that, all the papers for the most part had been doses that were beyond, that were high dose experiments where you don't see some of these effects that occur, these endocrine disrupting effects. And this is also a new paper here, 2021, glyphosate based formulations effect on honeybee behaviors. Um, this was an interesting one and getting into the issues of the honeybee microbiome and showing that they had many different uh, evidence of harm in terms of their behaviors, water responsiveness, uh, they had problems with sugar, um, they had learning and memory uh, disabilities, and they had uh, impaired movement, climbing uh, disruption, the disruption of their ability to climb. So um, that they were affected by these low dose glyphosate uh, formulations below the recommended concentration. And I think glyphosate is a major player in bee colony collapse syndrome, uh, something that uh, hasn't really been, they've been, of course, the insecticides are playing a role as well. And that's where all the focus has been. But I think we really need to uh, get rid of glyphosate before we're gonna solve the problem of the, the crisis that the bees are facing. <laughs> this is also a new paper, uh, 2020, effective glyphosate on water flea embryos. Uh, water fleas are very important, of course, at the base of the food chain in the waterways. Um, and so the tad tadpoles, the salamanders, the newts, aquatic insects, many types of small fish feed on these water fleas. So what they did was they exposed the water fleas to, again, very low levels of life of Roundup. And they studied them and they found out they had embryonic developmental failure. They had inflammation, which is the same thing that we're seeing with the um, Seralini study with the rats. Uh, collagen degradation, impaired wound healing, disrupted mu gut microbiome. So all of these issues are showing up in these water fleas. Um, and then, of course, the water fleas are going to work up the food chain to affect all, all the animals that eat the water fleas and the animals that eat the animals that eat the water, water fleas, etc., to cause uh, uh, damaging effects all the way up the food chain. Uh, this is very, very interesting. This is also brand new 2021. I'm finding all these new papers that are uh, revealing more about glyphosate. I found this one really, really intriguing because it suggests that Malaria could be a bigger problem in places where there's uh, significant exposure of the mosquitoes to, uh, to glyphosate. And this is also, this is based on melanin. And melanin is actually uh, one of the, um, it comes out of the trichomate pathway. So if the trichomate pathway is disrupted, melanin synthesis is going to be impaired. And they actually found uh, several different um, enzymes involved in melanin synthesis that were, um, that were affected by the glyphosate. Uh, and, and so it produced these highly reactive molecules that were then, um, but melanin produces highly reactive molecules that can kill uh, invasive species such as uh, microbes that are infecting the um, mosquito. And so uh, glyphosate suppressed several enzymes involved in the synthesis of melanin, which then causes the mosquitoes to be less able to control this particular uh, infective agent, plasmodium, uh, plasmodium which is the uh, cause of of malaria, that's the, my, uh, the species that causes malaria. It's not a bacterium. Uh, this was a, a disturbing paper about these deformed uh, piglets, malformed piglets from 2014. Um, e. Peterson was an author on this paper uh, together with Mar Margaret Kruger. This is in Europe and um, they looked at these. So these piglets were, were deformed and then they, they looked at their they measured glyphosate levels in their lungs, their liver, their kidney, their brain, the gut wall, and their heart, found it in all of those organs of these malformed animals. There were 38 of them. 
Um, and the highest concentrations were in the lungs and the heart. And then this is a quote from Eve Peterson, the summary of my findings is without a doubt that Roundup sprayed on crops is the direct reason for the increase in fertility problems, abortions, and deformities in animals. And as a farmer, knowing how nature works, I quite expect that people are already affected. Glyphosate is everywhere. Um, so this is a, um, a, a paper that I wrote together with Judy Hoy Nancy, and Nancy Swanson, The High Cost of Pep Pesticides, Human and Animal Diseases. And uh, Judy is the author of this book, Changing Faces. She, she is a, a very interesting person. She runs a wildlife rehabilitation center in the Bitterroot Valley in Western Montana. And she's been tracking the dwindling numbers and decreasing health status of wildlife there for decades. Um, so Dr. Nancy Swanson and I collaborated with her to look at health issues of, animal, of these animals that she was looking at and comparing those to humans to see if we could see a correlation between the effects on animals and the effects on humans. She, uh, Judy has a whole lot of pictures of different uh, organs and whatnot that have been clearly are damaged um, from these animals. She gets uh, these animals through her re rehabilitation center and then she uh, dissects them when they die and takes pictures of the, their organs. And so these are all examples, examples of thymuses. And these are healthy thymuses at the top. And you can see that these other ones are, are, are problematic in various ways. She found that many, many of the animals had a very disturbed looking thymus. Thymus is really crucial in the early days of the early, the beginning of life. The thymus is very active in causing the immune system to mature very important for the maturity of the immune system. So you're gonna get immune deficiency when your thymus is, is not working properly. So we had a whole bunch of diseases that we looked at in this paper. We looked at government data on glyphosate usage and government data on human disease patterns over time from hospital discharge data. And we found striking correlations between the rise in glyphosate usage and the rise in a, a number of health issues in newborn babies. And these are some of the ones that are discussed in this paper head and face anomalies, blood disorders, skin disorders, metabolic disorders, genital urinary disorders, congenital heart conditions, and lung problems. And all of these have extremely high correlation coefficients. The rise in these diseases in this database compared to the rise in the use of glyphosate on core crops. So R is the correlation coefficient characterizing how similar the two curves are. 1.0 is the highest value it can take representing a perfect match. So all of these are very close to a perfect match. And here's just an example of one of the uh, graphs from that paper. You can look up this paper if you wanna see all the other images that we have in the data that we show. This is congenital heart conditions in the newborns and enlarged right ventricle in adults, two different kinds of heart problems. Both of them have extremely low p-values for the probability that this could have occurred by chance. The green is the enlarged right ventricle and the blue is congenital heart problems and the red is the glyphosate usage on wheat, corn, and soy. And this is over time from 1997 to 2010. Uh, so, uh, so then just looking at heart issues, try to find the literature. There's a nice review paper. Again, Seralini, he was the one that published the one with uh, massive mammary tumors in the rats. Glyphosate-based herbic herbicides potently affect cardiovascular system in mammals. And this is a review of the literature. And they found evidence of uh, disruption of the heart in terms of long QT syndrome, atrioventricular block, arrhythmias in both humans and animals. And then a quote in fatalities, the common symptoms were ca cardiorespiratory arrest, cardiovascular shock, hemodynamic disturbances, um, that's like blood clots and hemorrhaging, intravascular disseminated co coagulation, which is massive small blood clots throughout the vascular system and multiple organ failure, which is a consequence of that. So quite a mess with the vascular system and with the heart uh, in, when there is a, a high dose exposure to glyphosate. Um, so this was another to topic that we looked at, genital urinary disorders, things like hypospadias and hydrocele. These are deformities uh, that in the newborn uh, male. So, so swollen testicle is this hydrocele with water in the testicle. And the other one, um, hypospadias, is where the urethra comes out too low. It should come out of the chip and it's nice. It's, it's someplace else on the penis. And so this is glyphosate usage is the red box and the disorders uh, all of them together is, uh, is the green. And there's certain ICD codes you can read here that uh, define what this, uh, what this represents. <clears throat> so is glyphosate causing an epidemic in fatty liver disease? Uh, I think so. And I think there's pretty clear evidence that it is. Uh, there's, there's a worldwide epidemic uh, today in fat, fatty liver disease. And so this paper um, by Robin Menage et al. Et al. 2017, multi, multi-omics reveal non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in rats 
following chronic exposure to an ultra low dose of Roundup herbicide. Again, this low dose is coming through in all these new papers. And then um, this is another paper that showed that glyphosate is correlated with fatty liver disease in humans. Really nice paper by Mills, also very recent, 2020. They looked at people who had fatty liver disease, compared them to people who didn't measure urinary glyph glyphosate, found statistically significant more glyphosate in the uh, cases versus the controls. And even when they looked at the people who had liver disease, the ones with more extreme disease had higher levels of glyphosate, statistically significantly higher levels than the ones who had less, uh, a less advanced form of liver disease. <clears throat> And then kidney failure is another thing that we're seeing, particularly in agricultural workers. This is quite disturbing in Central America and also in Sri Lanka. And there've been a number of papers that have been written about this strange disease. It's sort of an un unusual type of kidney failure that looks like a toxic, uh, some kind of toxicity in the kidneys. And, <clears throat> and there are agricultural workers in the sugarcane fields in Central America. And then I think the Sri Lanka is, is rice patties in Sri Lanka they're dying at a young age in record numbers from kidney failure. It's the second most common cause of death in young men in El Salvador. Uh, and they've attributed it to a number of things in various studies. And certainly arsenic and cadmium are among the possibilities from the uh, use of arsenic as an, as an, herb, as an herbicide. Um, and then nitrates are, are also an issue, nitrates in well water. But then they're thinking that glyphosate is working synergistically with these other uh, toxins to cause uh, increased uh, toxicity. And so that's this paper here by Jaya Sumana, which was in 2014. Um, so glyphosate chelates arsenic and then unloads it when it gets to the acidic environment of the renal tubules. That's a very interesting concept that it would carry hand carry the arsenic into the kidneys. And then when you get into an acidic environment, glyphosate lets go of the minerals, of the, of the metals that it's chelating. And then this paper talks about synergistic toxicity with paraquat because both of them were being used at the same time. And together they, they work, uh, they become more toxic than either one. Each of them makes the other one more toxic than it would otherwise be to destroy the kidneys of the agricultural workers in Sri Lanka. <clears throat> and uh, so kidney disease is not just among the agricultural workers because we're seeing a rise in kidney disease. This is uh, death due to renal failure in the United States over time, correlating with both the glyphosate usage, which is the red, and then also the GE, the percentage of G genetically engineered Roundup ready soy and corn crops. Both of those are sort of working right around this rise in the, in the kidney disease. So I think that very clear evidence that there's at least correlation between these two, these phenomena. And now, so this is just more and more of these diseases. I've been looking at so many diseases, as you can see, and I've written various papers. This is also with Nancy Swanson. She and I collaborated on many papers digging through this uh, the uh, data, databases from the United States government looking for correlations. And this is quite remarkable what we found with respect to various neurological diseases. Autism, of course, is the one I was most interested in, extremely highly correlated with the rise in glyphosate. Uh, ADHD, which is a, you know, this uh, hyperactivity uh, deficiency, hy um, hyperactivity disorder. <clears throat> uh, schizophrenia, um, anxiety, and then this is interesting, sleep disorder, very, very highly correlated. We hear a lot of chatter these days about people having trouble sleeping. And I suspect if they would go to a certified organic diet, that would be the best thing they could do to improve their sleep. And of course, sleep disorder is also linked to many of these other diseases. Um, so this is also a new paper. Well, this is 2015, but I only found about it, uh, out about it a couple short recently. Uh, I was fascinated by this because this, this uh, bug, Proteus mirabilis, it can fully metabolize glyphosate and use its phosphorus atom as a source of phosphorus. So this is showing if it's got phosphorus here, it, the uh, growth rate over time. This is no phosphorus, it's completely unable to grow, but you can give it glyphosate as an as a, uh, alternative to phosphate and it will be able to use the glyphosate as a source of phosphorus and grow pretty well. And so this means that this is gonna be very, um, it will remove glyphosate, but it will also, um, be able to thrive because of that, that it can, that it can uh, be resistant to glyphosate because it can remove it. And so um, it may be connected to, I think, to the rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease that's triggered by this uh, Proteus infection in the urinary tract infection. And this is just a paper that talks about that, where you get the urinary tract infection, you develop antibodies to this, to this Proteus microbe. And then those antibodies become autoantibodies due to molecular mimicry and they attack this the human protein here, which then causes cytotoxicity in the synovial fluid, synovial tissues. 
in the, in the joints, and then that ends up with the rheumatoid arthritis. So that's quite interesting to me. I think we should be looking for diseases that are affected by microbes that have some kind of ability to, uh, uh, to, to fight to be uh, safe in the context of glyphosate or to even be able to metabolize glyphosate, which becomes actually a, a benefit for the host if they can remove the glyphosate, but at the same time, they cause disease. Glyphosate in the gut. Um, so imbalance in gut microbiome has, is, is something that's been a big topic in recent papers. There's lots of really interesting, very complex papers about the gut microbiome and various distributions associated with different diseases. But um, <clears throat> gut microbiome imbalances are causing many, many different diseases, inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune arthritis, obesity, metabolic syndrome, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. They can all be traced to imbalances in the gut microbiome. And then, um, and then here's a picture showing this gut microbiota and all these different conditions that can be affected by uh, these being out of, out of balance. And so um, glyphosate has been shown to um, affect the gut microbiome. And in fact, it's been shown to preferentially kill beneficial microbes, which allows the pathogens to flourish. This causes um, a, a, a leaky gut barrier through inflammation. It causes immune cells to infiltrate into the gut tissue and they release these inflammatory cytokines that then cause uh, increased risk to all these diseases, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and celiac disease, gluten, which is gluten intolerance, another thing that we have an epidemic in. And this is just showing the leaky gut, the, the microbes and, and various materials escape the gut. These um, immune cells come in and then they release these inflammatory signals that then cause uh, de tissue damage. <clears throat> Uh, so here's inflammatory bowel disease, another one of these papers from Nancy Swanson. This particular paper from 2014 has something like 30 different figures of different correlations of glyphosate usage over time with various diseases. Inflammatory bowel disease is one of them with a very, very low p-value, very high correlation coefficient. Uh, and this is another uh, uh, plot, a Nancy plot, and Samson and I published a paper in interdisciplinary toxicology on glyphosate and celiac disease. And we showed in that paper that um, glyphosate usage on wheat, this is just wheat, cor correlates well with celiac disease, that's the yellow boxes, pretty good match there. Um, and so uh, this is suggesting, I, I believe it's actually the case that glyphosate is a major causal factor in the epidemic that we're seeing today in gluten intolerance and probably in a lot of the other food allergies that we've been experiencing today. There's just so many more people who are sensitive to various foods today than there were when I was a child. I didn't know anybody who had any kind of food sensitivities. It was quite shocking how much that has changed over time. So this is, um, again, Samson and I uh, did this study where he actually got a hold of some um, in enzymes from a porcine enzymes of trypsin, pepsin, and lipase from a lab, from a chemical lab. And he tested them for glyphosate and found gly high levels of glyphosate in all three of them. And I think this is disrupting, disrupting their ability to uh, perform their enzymatic function. So this prevents uh, proteins like gluten from being properly digested. And then the undigested proteins um, induce a release of zonulin, which then opens up the gut barrier. And that allows the undigested proteins to get into the general circulation and cause autoimmune disease. And so this here's just some correlations, celiac disease, glyphosate, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Glyphosate preferentially kills the class of bacteria called bif bifidobacteria, which are very, very important in the early days of the infant's life. Uh, these bifidobacteria have been shown to be depleted in association with celiac disease. And celiac disease is also associated with an increased risk in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. In fact, that's the main reason why people with this disease tend to have a shortened lifespan. And then glyphosate itself, itself is also, of course, also directly linked to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, and we know that from all these um, successful trials in court. So glyphosate and autism, um, this is a, a, a plot that I was really uh, opened my eyes to the possibility of glyphosate causing autism. And I still feel very confident that I'm right, that glyphosate is the primary, it's not the only, but it's the primary reason why we have an epidemic in autism today, which is a shocking epidemic is one in 54. Currently the 12 year olds, uh, have autism according to the CDC. It's a shocking number. And so um, this paper with, I wrote together with James Beecham, published in 2016, discusses some of the ideas for how glyphosate could be causing autism. And um, just looking at uh, clostridia, because clostridia seemed to play an important role in, in autism, you can see that this was a paper that showed the um, 
different microbe sensitivity to glyphosate. The ones that are small here have very high sensitivity. It knocks them way down. Bifidobacteria in particular is, is the lowest of all of these that are shown here. Clostridia and Salmonella, on the other hand, are quite hardy against glyphosate. So they thrive. When these other microbes get killed off, these two thrive and you get um, disease, you get infections. And Clostridium in particular seems to be very tightly coupled with autism. This was a study that looked at 14 autistic children with gut disorder compared to 21 controls. They saw this significant in increase in Clostridia species in the, in, the, in the autistic kids, which was associated with reduced tryptophan levels and increased expression of inflammatory markers. Those are both going to be characteristic of glyphosate because tryptophan is one of those aromatic amino acids that comes out of the chicken mate pathway. And then the macrophages in the inflamed tissue, they actually take up tryptophan, reducing the bioavailability of it to the brain. Tryptophan is a precursor to serotonin, and serotonin is extremely important in the brain. Both serotonin and melatonin come out of uh, that pathway. And so um, they propose in the paper that antibiotics could be causing the problems. Glyphosate is a patented antimicrobial agent, and so it too... Um, can, it can be seen as an antibiotic to cause these problems that they were seeing with these kids. This one is even more striking because he specifically looked at glyphosate. This paper from 2017, elevated urinary glyphosate and clostridium metabolites with altered dopamine metabolism in triplets with autistic spectrum disorder or suspected seizure disorder case study. So with three, three kids, two boys, one girl, both of the boys were diagnosed with autism. The girl had a seizure disorder. All three of them had very high levels of glyphosate in their urine. And then he detected the clostridia overgrowth, which he su suspected was due to glyphosate's disruption of the gut microbiome. Uh, clostridia produce toxins, which actually block the conversion of dopamine to norepinephrine. So you get excess dopamine in the brain and dopamine can become very damaging to the neurons. It can become neuroexcitotoxic through oxidative stress if it can't be uh, converted to norepinephrine. Um, and this is a paper, a recent paper, 2019, where they look at gut microbiota, my, gut microbiota and neurological effects of glyphosate. Um, in this work, we state a possible link between glyphosate-induced dysbiosis and cognitive and motor aggravations in neurodegenerative and neurodevelopmental pathologies, such as autism. Hence, we view the negative impact that glyphosate-induced dysbiosis may have on depression, anxiety, autism, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's disease. And all of these diseases are going up dramatically in step with a rise in glyphosate usage. Uh, here's a paper from 2020, autism-like sy symptoms following maternal glyphosate exposure. And this was a, a study um, where they exposed the uh, mice to uh, glyphosate during pregnancy, and they looked for the risk for autism in the progeny. So the pregnant mice had high dose glyphosate in this case uh, during pregnancy and lactation. And then they saw that it was autism-like symptoms in, in the offspring, and also that they had an uh, imbalanced gut microbiome and disrupted fatty acid metabolism. And they particularly noted an enzyme called soluble epoxyhydrolase, soluble EH, in the prefrontal cortex of the brain of these offspring, which produces pro-inflammatory fatty acid derivatives. So this is a fatty acid. This enzyme does this funny thing, putting this oxygen in here. This becomes a, this is a very active signaling molecule that induces oxidative stress and inflammation. And this uh, elevation of this enzyme has been linked to many different diseases, depression, autism, schizophrenia, and Parkinson's disease. So how to explain all this? The story links together vitamin D, cytochrome P450 enzymes, aromatase, estrogen, testosterone, and soluble EH. So because maternal vitamin D, D deficiency causes high testosterone, in the male offspring. Aromatase deficiency causes low estrogen because aromatase converts testosterone to estrogen. And so estrogen actually suppresses this enzyme, but because the estrogen is not being produced because the aromatase is defective, you end up with overexpression of this enzyme and then you get this oxidative stress and inflammation. Vitamin D activation depends on cytochrome people 50 enzymes, which are blocked by glyphosate. Aromatase also is a cyp enzyme. So all these enzymes are getting disrupted and that gives you the low estrogen, the low vitamin D, and the high SEH that's characteristic of these animals. So here's just some data on that. Here's a, a paper showing that glyphosate suppresses aromatase in the placenta. And these were agricultural workers, female agricultural workers, using glyphosate had fertility problems, showing that the placental cells uh, were exposed to glyphosate caused a had suppression of aromatase expression. Uh, which is going to mean then excess testosterone and insufficient estrogen during development. Uh, and they showed that the additional ingredients in Roundup also increased the 
glyphosate toxicity. <clears throat> and so here's um, a developmental vitamin D deficiency increases fetal exposure to testosterone. So this is just showing that vitamin D needs to be high in order to uh, lower the amount of testosterone exposure in the brain. It regulates the expression via methylation. So you get hypermethylation of the promoter, which then turns down the gain on the expression of aromatase. Um, so this is another way to cause the aromatase deficiency. On top of the fact that the, the enzyme itself gets suppressed by glyphosate, it also gets um, suppressed by this problem of vitamin D deficiency. And then they've shown that excess testosterone during development leads to autism in males. And this is just showing the uh, sype enzymes. These are all the different sype enzymes in the liver that are able to convert vitamin D, which is this one, to this 125 hydroxy vitamin D, which is the active form of vitamin D. These, uh, these enzymes are all involved in doing that. <clears throat> uh, here's a paper, glyphosate exposure induces synaptic impairment in hippocampal neurons and cognitive defects deficits in developing rats. So this is quite remarkable because it showed that the neurons when grown in culture exposed to glyphosate, they showed a decrease in this dendritic complexity in spine formation. It turns out this is a characteristic feature of neurons in autism. Um, they were exposed to glyphosate uh, every two days from seven days old to 27 days old, and it sh they showed cognitive impairments and reduced synaptic protein expression. Very important in the hippocampus because the hippocampus is a central player in autism in humans. And so this is another paper that just shows that this is true for um, neural development and axon growth are altered by glyphosate through a Wnt non-canonical canonical signaling pathway. So this is getting into the actual biochemistry of it. They grew these neurons in culture, they exposed them to glyphosate, same thing. They lost all these dendritic branches. These neurons became very naked, so to speak, uh, not developing properly. Um, and that's a, a characteristic feature of autism as shown by this paper. Specifically, autism has been linked to a decrease in the density of spines with mature morphology, indicating a general spine immaturity state in autism, exactly what you're seeing with the glyphosate exposure. <clears throat> um, and so this paper shows, um, looking again at neural stem cells grown in culture from this, this critical zone, subventricular zone of the, of the mouse, they demonstrated permissible concentrations of glyphosate in drinking water that are recognized by, by the EPA to be safe. They're capable of inducing neurotoxicity in the developing ner nerves, nervous system. So they say our findings signify the need to review the safety standards established by environmental protection agencies concerning safe glyphosate concentrations in drinking water. <laughs> to recapitulate all of this, glyphosate causes overrepresentation of clostridia in the gut, depleting tryptophan. This maps to brain damage through inflammation. It causes autism-like symptoms in male mice linked to increased expression of this soluble epoxy hydrolase. Estrogen decreases the expression aromatase, uh, converts testosterone to estrogen aromatase, gets blocked by glyphosate, and so this doesn't happen. And you get this overexpression of this enzyme. Um, and this explains glyphosate's effects and linked to autism. Low estrogen leads to high SCH. Maternal vitamin D deficiency leads to excess testosterone in the males. Vitamin D depends on the liver sype enzymes, which are suppressed by glyphosate. And aromatase itself is a sype enzyme, and that explains how glyphosate could suppress it. Um, and then glyphosate suppresses the maturation of these neuronal, neuronal dendritic spikes in the brain, which is a characteristic feature of autism. So glyphosate and endocrine disruption. Um, Glyphosate is an endocrine disruption, disruptor. This is a new paper from 2020. It's a review paper. It has a lot of references and it has all these different um, references showing various evidence of glyphosate disrupting the endocrine system. And the endocrine system consists of all these glands and they produce a whole bunch of hormones uh, like thyroid hormone and, and the sex hormones. And um, many of those hormones are obviously disrupted by glyphosate. Uh, one paper showed that very tiny amounts of glyphosate cause breast cancer cells to proliferate. So it's like an estrogenic effect. Um, it increases the expression levels of estrogen and progesterone receptors. Um, it disrupts the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. It alters circulating levels of various hormones. It induces hypothyroidism in female Wister rats. It altered reproductive development and parameters in animal models. And this one is a very interesting malformation in zebrafish embryos. So these are just all these different papers are referenced here that explain all of these effects of glyphosate obviously showing that it is an endocrine disruptor. Uh, Zen Honeycutt is a friend of mine. She's the founder of Moms Across America, a great advocacy group trying to get the message out about the dangers of glyphosate in our food. 
And uh, she actually very active politically. She actually went to a, a developmental and reproductive toxic identification committee. She, she met with them uh, and presented slides arguing that glyphosate is an endocrine disruptor. This is in California where she was at the time. And the California's EPA office was assess, assessing the health hazard, was running through a health hazard assessment of various chemicals with the potential of uh, considering labeling some of them as being uh, uh, officially an endocrine disruptor. And her slides were very powerful. And because of those slides, the committee voted that glyphosate should be labeled as a high probability endocrine disruptor on the Prop 65 list. And, you know, California had also listed glyphosate as a uh, cancer, uh, probable cancer cause, cause causing agent, which has caused the um, Monsanto to be quite upset. Uh, so this is a new paper again, 2021. Maternal urinary levels of glyphosate during pregnancy and, and anal genital distance in newborns in a U.S. multicenter pregnancy cohort. A very interesting and significant paper, I believe, which showed they measured the glyphosate levels in the urine of the mother mid-pregnancy, and they measured this metric called the anal genital distance in the girls. If it's long, it's an indication of more male-like typical profile, which indicates excess exposure to uh, testosterone in utero, which is what we're going to expect with this suppression of aromatase. And so it makes sense. Uh, in terms of biochemically, it makes sense that this would happen. Um, and they had, had done an earlier study on rats where they had found a similar result. And again, this is the aromatase problem, which in this confirms that glyphosate is an endocrine disruptor in humans. And in fact, this, this metric is a, an indicator of a much higher risk to developing a syndrome called polycystic ovary syndrome. Uh, which is something that's a, quite an epidemic these days. We have something like 20% of the world's population are suffering from PCOS. And this is associated with uh, infertility problems, irregular periods or no menstrual cycle, excess hair growth, and uh, obviously uh, impaired ability to have children. And so also an increased risk to being diagnosed with autism or to having progeny with autism. So quite interesting, this syndrome, which is caused by glyphosate uh, due to the excess testosterone in utero, is causing all of these problems. Uh, glyphosate in premature birth, another recent paper, 2021, a study based in P Puerto Rico, 53 cases of premature birth compared to 194 controls. They adjusted the models for a number of different uh, adjustment conditions. They measured both glyphosate and AMPA. AMPA is a breakdown product of glyphosate. And the women who had high uh, levels of AMPA, which they defined as greater than 0.65 micrograms per liter, at 26 weeks of gestation, close to the end of the, of the cycle, they had a 4.5 fold increased risk of having a premature baby with a very high, very significant p-value. And gly high urinary glyphosate was also associated with a slightly lesser 3.77 fold increased risk. Uh, and and uh, pre premature birth is, an ep is a national epidemic and it's especially bad in Puerto Rico, one of the highest uh, levels of numbers of premature birth in Puerto Rico compared to the other states. Um, it's costing the United States $26.2 billion per year. Uh, another new paper, 2021, glyphosate sperm counts in cancer. This paper was quite amazing to me. They had these plots and I've got, I put them up here, sperm counts, testicular cancer, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And they're looking at places across the United States, looking at the sperm counts, comparing them to glyphosate usage in that region. So this is a spatial analysis of glyphosate usage across the country. And they showed um, very striking p-values here, extremely low p-values for all three of these uh, patterns of the correlation between these conditions. non hodgkins lymphoma, testicular cancer was fantastically highly correlated with glyphosate. And then the sperm counts, of course, is probably connected to testicular cancer because it's showing the glyphosate is damaging sperm. And other da data, other papers that I have on file are also showing damage to the sperm directly by glyphosate. <clears throat> this is glyphosate-based herbicides produce teratogenic effects on vertebrates by impairing retinoic acid signaling. That's another one of these um, endocrine disrupting effects. And um, retinoic acid actually depends upon cytochrome P450 enzymes to be removed. And during development, you have to have very critical uh, increases and decreases of retinoic acid under critical control in order for development to work properly. And so what happens is you get excess retinoic acid because it's not being removed by cyp enzymes, just like the testosterone problem. And it causes inhibition of these various enzymes, which then leads to all these different uh, de developmental disorders in the neural crest. The cyclopia is one eye, small brain, um, various effects of the craniofacial malformations. It's, this experiment was done with tadpoles. 
<coughs> transgenerational effects. Um, just a couple slides here. Developmental exposure to glyphosate-based herbicides and depressive-like behavior in adult offspring, implication of glutamate excitotoxicity and oxidative stress. Um, and this is an important paper because they exposed to the mother rats to glyphosate while they were pregnant and for 15 days following the birth of the offspring. So only the mothers were exposed, not the offspring, not directly. Um, then the offspring suffered from glutamate excitotoxicity in their brains. And that's something that's also shown up in many other papers that I have on file on glyphosate showing glutamate excitotoxicity along with the dopamine uh, excitotoxicity that we're seeing as well. Uh, and this, this excitotoxicity persisted even after the exposure was terminated. When the offspring were 60 days old, they showed signs of depression in a forced swimming test. This is this kind of test that you can use to see how they respond uh, to a, uh, a stressful situation. <clears throat> and now this one is quite amazing. And there's actually it's a couple papers here. Uh, really, it's the same group, I believe. And it's really fascinating studies where they expose pregnant rats to glyphosate at a very low level, half of the no observable adverse effect level from day eight to day 14 of gestation. They timed it to match the time when the germ cell epigenetic programming takes place. So the, the, the female fetus develops her germs, germ line, her future the cells for her future children before she even develops, like in very early stages of pregnancy, the first third of pregnancy, this, uh, this happens first before the fetus actually develops into a full formed animal. And so they exposed them to glyphosate at that critical period. And so then they took the offspring, they bred them to produce pups and grand pups and great grand pups, so three different generations. And then the exposed rats looked fine. They had no obvious symptoms. The F1 generation were mostly fine as well. The ones that were in utero at the time that they got exposed. What was interesting is you started to see effects in the F2 and the F3 generations. And they suffered from many diseases, including mammary tumors, delayed early puberty, premature birth, prostate disease, kidney disease, and obesity. All these things started to show up in the later generations and even more in the F3 than in the F2. So this is what's called epigenetic effects where the germline is actually remembering the experience that it had in utero and it's marking itself in special ways to remember that. And that's causing a, pro a programming change in future generations that um, takes a long time to disappear. Very, very interesting. So my new book, Toxic Legacy, expected to be released on July 1st, very soon presents extensive data on glyphosate toxicity to animals and humans. It provides compelling arguments that glyphosate is insidiously cumulatively toxic through its diabolical insertion into proteins by mistake in place of the coding amino acid glycine. That's the central thesis of my book. And I explained it biochemically, how that can, how that can justify how one chemical could cause so many different diseases. Um, so uh, I hope you'll check this out. How to stay healthy in a toxic world. We're wrapping up with the last little bit. Obviously, go organic. This is a picture of my kitchen table. And we pitched all of our non-organic food at one point, sometime in 2013. You know, we just let it all go and, um, and started over. And we bought everything organic, even our spices, our beer, our wine. All of our food is certified organic. And if we can't find it certified organic, we don't eat it. And I would encourage all of you to think about doing that as well. Um, here's the difference between non-GMO versus USDA organic. People often think non-GMO is good enough, but of course that's not true because they're, they allow synthetic pesticides. They allow Roundup in particular, hexane, sewage sludge, an antibiotics, ractopamine, these are all bad things. So there's many, many reasons to go certified organic to get healthy food, not just glyphosate. Uh, I encourage people to eat a lot of natural probiotic foods. Uh, I eat apple cider vinegar every day. We always make a big salad and we make our own salad dressing using this Bragg's Organic. Uh, things like kombucha and kimchi and sauerkraut, these are all very healthy foods that will help to maintain healthy microbiome. Uh, I have identified several nutrients that I feel are important. I, I like Epsom salt baths. I think that's a nice way to get sulfate. In my book, I talk a lot about uh, the, how glyphosate messes up the sulfate system. I didn't have time to cover that here because it's kind of technical, and, uh, but you can read the book uh, to find out about exactly how that happens. But I like to try to get a lot of sulfur foods that are rich in sulfur. And I love garlic, we eat a lot of garlic and onions. Uh, vitamin C is also important for metabolism. Methyl tetrahydrofolate, but not folic acid. B12, this is B12, cobalamin. This is also getting messed up by glyphosate. And acetylcysteine is a good source of sulfur. It's a natural organic sulfur compound. And glutathione, of course, is too. Glutathione uh, contains cysteine is one of its three amino acids. Taurine is also a sulfur containing amino acid. It's high levels in fish and, uh, 
curcumin, of course, is a wonderful spice. They use it a lot in India, and I think that's one of the reasons why they have uh, reduced levels of Alzheimer's disease. So this, these things are all herbs and spices in general are really encourage, important to eat lots of them in your food. Um, this was an interesting paper on glyphosate poisoning in cows. Uh, <clears throat> the cows had high levels of glyphosate in the urine and they were sick and they fed them sauerkraut juice, bentonite clay, activated charcoal and fulvic and humic acid. Um, very interesting combination of natural things that were used to help to reduce their levels of glyphosate and improve their health. And this was one on chickens that was done where they used biochar, bentonite, and zeolite to maintain healthy microbial distribution in the poultry. So these are ways that I think that you can try to combat glyphosate exposure. Uh, here's another one, which is quite interesting. All these kind of weed plants actually have the ability to protect you from glyphosate. So this was a paper that talked about Roundup being toxic to liver cells and embryonic cells at low doses. Um, and they extracted uh, common extracts from common plants like dandelions, barberry, and burdock. Uh, and if you, especially if you have them before exposure, they can help to reduce the damage caused by the, by the Roundup. Uh, healthy living is the best way to protect yourself from COVID-19. Uh, vitamin D deficiency is associated with a fourfold increased risk of dying from COVID-19. And I find that very interesting because we have an epidemic in vitamin D deficiency in this country. And I believe it's partly, or even perhaps mostly due to the inability of the liver and the kidneys to activate vitamin D to, to turn it into its active form. Uh, so you need those type enzymes to make the 1,25 hydroxy vitamin D that is the active form. And vitamin C and vitamin K2 deficiencies are also linked to poor outcomes. Vitamin K2 in particular comes out of the chickenate pathway. Countries where fermented foods are a dietary staple have in general lower infection rates than countries where they're not. And I believe the most important way to, to protect yourself from glyphosate, from COVID-19, are to eat a certified organic whole foods diet a nutrient dense diet and to get out in the sunlight without sunscreen, without sunglasses. And I talk a lot about the sunlight in my book and how it can help to improve your health. Conclusions, glyphosate is far more toxic to humans than we've been led to believe. The rise in glyphosate usage on core crops in the United States correlates with the rise in prevalence of many diseases and conditions. It causes gut dysbiosis, which is increasingly recognized as a major driver behind multiple chronic diseases. Glyphosate's disruption of the gut microbes, the psych enzymes, and the hormones can play a significant role in autism and other neurological diseases. Glyphosate causes infertility in both males and females, as well as developmental disorders. Many papers published in the last few years are revealing remarkably severe effects, low doses of glyphosate in animal studies, including transgenerational effects. And in my opinion, glyphosate should be banned worldwide. And I have a quote here from Professor Don Huber, who's the person who first introduced me to glyphosate. He's a personal hero. Future historians may well look back upon our time and write not about how many pounds of pesticide we did, pesticide we did or didn't apply, but by how willing we are to sacrifice our children and future generations for this massive genetic engineering experiment that is based on flawed science and failed promises just to benefit the bottom line of a commercial enterprise. And then I think I have one more slide here, which was from the host. So should I turn it over to someone else or how do we do this? Yep. Thank you, Dr. Seneff. Uh, this slide brings to light our upcoming webinars on Thursday, July 1st. We will have Regenerating Human Health, Nourishing Your Immune System with Sarah Keogh. And on Thursday, July 8th at 7 p.m. Central, we will have a webinar, Increasing Profitability in a Corn Bean Rotation with Dan DeSutter, David Brandt, and David Kleinschmidt. So we look forward to those upcoming webinars. Thank you, Dr. Seneff. That, that uh, uh, brings up a lot of questions and obviously stirs a lot of thought. So mm -hmm. if you don't mind, I'm gonna get right into the questions. Okay, so I stop share and I'll... Oh. You can just leave up that way. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. That slide would be fine. Okay. Uh, thank you. So our first question comes all the way from Romania. And okay. the, the person states that there's a lot of glyphosate being used in Romania. And they want to know how long does this chemical remain toxic in the ground? Well, that's unfortunately um, much longer than what we've been told by the industry in many cases. And it does depend upon the soil type as far as 
whether the guy, I, mean, I mentioned, for example, in the water where it goes into those uh, biofilms and stays there for a long time, it can get, uh, it can get, uh, enzymes can't get at it in certain cases, and then it will just stick around. It'll get tied up and, and, uh, and be protected from enzymatic action. And uh, for example, in the deep sea, um, if you get below the, the point where sunlight penetrates, it can stick around for over a year in the ocean at the bottom. <laughs> and it can, as I mentioned in one of my uh, slides, it, it was found 12 years later in trees that were exposed 12 years preceding that. So it can stay around for a very long time. There's various studies that have looked at specifically, you know, looking at pots and putting glyphosate in and they're finding that it will survive for a long time under um, many conditions. So it depends on the conditions. If there's, I think if there's good exposure to sunlight, that helps to de degrade it faster. And if there are in, uh, microbes in the soil that are able to break it down, and if those microbes can get at it, I think those will all be helpful for, for removing it. But it is an important research topic, I think, to figure out how to get rid of glyphosate in the soil if it yes. effectively. Yes, that, that's correct. I had a discussion with uh, Dr. Huber and Dr. David Johnson about that very thing. And, and they said, the best way to remediate it is with uh, diverse plant species, uh, obviously, which will proliferate by diverse biology. And Dr. Johnson stated there is certain microorganisms that will consume those compounds, but right. unfortunately, we don't have many of those in our soils. So right. we need to practice these regenerative practices with a lot of diversity, diverse cover crops, uh, in order to to remediate these soils. Right, and it's actually interesting with respect to Florida, Florida waterways and their problems with cyanobacteria because cyanobacteria are able to fully metabolize glyphosate, and when they overgrow, then you end up with this uh, toxic uh, algae problem that is really confronting Florida these days. I think glyphosate is playing a major role in that. Mm -hmm. The red tide. The red tide is based on the uh, cyanobacteria that are robust because they're able to, and they're actually serving a useful role in removing the glyphosate, but they're also creating a big problem at the same time. Yes, certainly. Next question. What about people using glyphosate in their gardens to, be, to do a burn down prior to planting non-GMO seeds? Will the glyphosate show up in those vegetables? I expect so. I mean, I, would, I wouldn't imagine that it has disappeared by the time the seeds are planted. So I would think so, yes. Mm -hmm. which, which brings another question that was asked, you know, in your presentation tonight, you, you uh, put forward a lot of cases where people are being, uh, have glyphosate in their system. How are they getting that if they're right. in an urban and type setting? Is it in the air or is it in the food? Good, good question. I, that's what I've been trying to figure out as well. And I've been looking a long time and gotten some hints at it. And quite, quite interesting because I think the food may be the most important source. So that's, you know, you're eating it. So it's going into your digestive system. But I think the other sources are also important. In certain areas, there's probably glyphosate in the water, especially if you live in agricultural areas. You know, if you have well water and you have, you're surrounded by agricultural farms that are using glyphosate, I can't imagine that you don't have glyphosate in your well water. Then uh, systems, you know, the, the municipal systems are supposed to, they do processing, for example, with chlorine and chlorine has been known to uh, be able to break down glyphosate. So hopefully it's getting broken down non-enzymatically for the most part by, this, by, by the treatment plants, you know, that for the, uh, for the water supply in, in municipal systems. I'm hoping that that means that it's not that big a problem in, in major, you know, municipal water supplies. Um, the air is a, another really, really interesting question. And I was actually fascinated by a paper, which I didn't show here today, but from, out of Brazil, again, a very recent paper where they looked at uh, glyphosate in nanoparticles in the air. And in the region of Brazil, Northeast Brazil, they looked at both um, the agricultural areas where glyphosate was being used on the crops and they looked in the city. And they were surprised to find that there was more glyphosate in the nanoparticles in the city than there was in the agricultural areas. Uh, which I think they really didn't know how to explain. I suspect it might have to do with biofuels. And I have talked a lot about this recently because I think it's linked to COVID-19. Um, Brazil is a leader in the biofuel industry, particularly bioethanol that they make from, from sugarcane that's sprayed with glyphosate before harvest. 
And I think the bioethanol contains glyphosate, and I think it's getting um, evaporating from the fuel before it reaches combustion. And so <laughs> that's how you could explain glyphosate in the nanoparticles in the air in the city. And so people in cities uh, where biofuels are being heavily used, I suspect they're breathing glyphosate into their lungs. And I think that may be a factor in bad outcomes for COVID-19 because glyphosate is a, is a very hard on the immune system. You saw those thymuses from those uh, deer that Judy Hoy had, had uh, analyzed. Uh, glyphosate, really, I, I think it's really hitting hard on the innate immune system and weakening it to the point where you can't fight off viruses very easily. <clears throat> I have to say that's the first time I have heard about glyphosate in biofuels. And uh, knowing the biofuel industry, many of those are, of course, uh, genetically modified. And often therapy. sprayed with glyphosate all just before mm -hmm. harvest, too, because they do here in the United States, we, we take the wheat crop, we spray it with glyphosate shortly before harvest, we harvest it, and then we take the rubble and turn it into biofuel. It went in places where that's going on. It's, it's an increasing, you know, it's, bit, it's sort of a promising industry to try to reduce the consumption of oil. So, it, you know, we're encouraged to do it, but we have to watch out, I think, about getting glyphosate in that biofuel because it's going to really cause serious problems with the lungs, I believe. Yeah. This is not proven. It's just a theory, but it looks good to me. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, being from North Dakota, obviously, number one, hard red spring wheat producing state. Um, I can say that that is not a common practice using glyphosate as a desiccant. I'm glad it you did is, that. It is used uh, uh, occasionally in very, uh, if wet conditions persist just prior to harvest, but in North Dakota, that doesn't happen very often. Mm. Uh, sometimes uh, doing work as we do at Understanding Ag in the Canadian Prairie Provinces, it is used some there. I, I don't think, as a rule, it's as large, uh, as widely used to practice as as some may think it is. So that's good to know. Yeah. That's very encouraging. I think North Dakota does quite a bit of biofuel, doesn't it? It's it a does. Thing in it North does. Dakota. Yeah, you probably know yeah. a lot more about it than I do. So now you're scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should look into it because I would love to know. It's just a theory on my part, and I'd love yeah. to know if there's any validity to it. Yeah. Next question. This is a really good one. It's about uh, deer hunters spraying their food plots with, with glyphosate, which I know is a very common practice. And then they are, of course, uh, growing crops in those food plots to attract deer. If ah. deer consume that, would, oh they, would oh they be exposed to the glyphosate? Absolutely. I mean, this is the thing that Judy Hoy found. The deer in her area were so sick and they're very, they're very much in trouble. You know, they have this chronic wasting disease syndrome that I think is caused by glyphosate. I haven't spoken about that publicly, but it's an interesting connection uh, to prion diseases. I believe glyphosate is a causal factor in prion diseases and this um, chronic CWD, chronic wasting disease in the deer population in the United States, I suspect is um, glyphosate is causal, causal in that. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't uh, want to eat that deer meat. Yeah, <laughs> if I'm going to feed no. them glyphosate, I wouldn't want to eat it. <laughs> no, many, many think that their wild game is, is organic, but little do they know. Interestingly enough, I can attest to that. Um, I, of course, do not use spray glyphosate and, and, uh, grow all non-GMO crops and I can sit on my front deck any evening and watch a hundred deer that have laid in my neighbor's GMO cornfields all day mm. travel a half a mile and come to my non-GMO fields to eat. Oh they'll go right so, through them and come to yours right? Yeah That's so the, so the wildlife know. The wildlife. That's wonderful I wish we could taste the difference because that would help a lot if people could taste the glyphosate in their food I think it would make a big difference. Yep. Which is another question we have is, are there tests that can be done on food to test for glyphosate? Absolutely. And in fact, many of the um, advocacy groups are doing that. Zen uh, Honeycutt is one of them who has, she, for example, she found she tested glyphosate in a number of um, California wines and she found glyphosate in all of them. Mm. And um, people have looked at uh, other uh, uh, environmental groups have looked at um, Cheerios and, and um, uh, goldfish crackers and uh, Oreo cookies, all of them 
are contaminated with pretty high levels of glyphosate. Uh, Cheerios, it, it really bothers me because it was really shockingly high levels in Cheerios. And that's such a popular food for little kids. They like to pick up the little Cheerios. And mm -hmm. I know my kids used to, we just used to put the Cheerios right on them, right on the high chair and let them just pick it up. You know, they yeah. loved it. Finger yeah. food. Very, very toxic. That's right. In your presentation, you discussed uh, near the end of it about glyphosate and then AMPA. Yes. And um, there's some questions that which is really more toxic? Is it the glyphosate right. or is it the AMPA? That's an excellent question. I believe the glyphosate is more toxic, but AMPA is definitely toxic. That's been shown. They're both, they're both toxic. But if I'm right about glyphosate getting into proteins by mistake in, in place of the coding amino acid glycine, that has huge consequences. And it looks to me like, you'll read, if you read my book, you'll see it's kind of a giant jigsaw puzzle, but it fits together very, very well to argue that that is happening. And if that is happening, that explains why it's accumulating in our tissues. And it also explains why it could be affecting so many different enzymes that are critical for metabolism that would be causing all these different diseases that are going up dramatically. So it's a giant puzzle. I really love puzzles and this one is a real, a real zinger. Um, but I believe it, it is a tremendous support that this is what's happening. And the um, industry is denying it. They're saying that what I'm proposing is preposterous, basically. It can't happen. So we're definitely a bit of a polarization there in the in the viewpoints, but I'm hoping that uh, some chemists will come along and basically prove that it is happening at some point. That's what I need. I need for someone to prove it. But science is not, is difficult, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, on that subject, a attendee asked this question: Glyphosate breaks down to AMPA. Yes. So do phosphate fertilizers. I don't Good. think so. I don't think they do. Aren't they phosphate? They're not phosphonate, right? AMPA is amino methyl uh, phosphonic acid. Yes. I think that, I don't think the phosphate fertilizers would break down the AMPA. I, I, I don't do, know, I but do I don't think, I that. think they're phosphate. They're not phosphonate. Phosphonate is quite an interesting molecule. Of course, there's that CP bond. Glyphosate has a carbon phosphorus bond. That's what's difficult to break down. Most, uh, none of our cells know how to break that down, but many microbes have what's called CP lyase, which is an enzyme that can break a CP bond, but they can't necessarily break, break the one in glyphosate because it has to fit properly into the enzyme structure. So some microbes have actually evolved to change the properties of their CP lyase so it's very effective at breaking down glyphosate. Of course, they've got a big win then because they can, they can remove it. And I think we need to find microbes that can do that and we need to put them in our soil to clear our glyphosate efficiently. We need that, I think. Yes. <laughs> but I don't think that, I think the phosphate fertilizers are something different. Okay. But, but AMPA is definitely toxic in and of itself. And I haven't um, specifically looked at studies on AMPA toxicity to know exactly how that works, but I know it's toxic. Okay. Here's a, another question. Does <laughs> glyphosate disrupt amino acids in our body? <clears throat> excuse me, because our microbiome is crucial to protein digestion, and therefore we can't access those aromatic amino acids, which disrupts everything that those amino acids make downstream, or because we are, we're dependent on our microbiome to synthesize phenylalanine, tryptophan, etc., yeah, I'm not sure what the two things that are being distinguished, but it, it's, it's all true. The microbes uh, make those three amino acids using the pathway that glyphosate disrupts. So when you block the pathway, they're not able to make enough of it. And we get a significant amount of our, of our supply of those through our microbiome normally. And there's also those B vitamins, which come out of that same pathway. And, they, and microbes also make B vitamins for their host. So we hadn't realized how important the microbiome was in supplying certain nutrients that our cells are pretty incompetent, actually. There's lots of things they can't do. And methionine is another one that I mentioned. And glyphosate disrupts the synthesis of methionine from inorganic sulfur by the uh, microbiome. And we, again, we can't do that. Our cells don't know how to do that, but our microbes do it for us. And they do it with enzymes that get disrupted by glyphosate. So actually methionine deficiency is another one that goes with uh, autism and goes with glyphosate exposure because again of messing up the microbes. And once you once the microbes can't use these enzymes, they also get broken, they get sick. So then they can't do everything else they would normally do because they're getting killed off by the glyphosate. And the problem is that the beneficial microbes, the ones that are supposed to really settle in in the infant gut, are especially sensitive to glyphosate. So the infant gut gets all messed up early on. 
and that creates a digestive nightmare. They can't digest milk. They get you know, uh, casein intolerances because they can't break down that protein. The uh, lactobacillus are very important to assist us in, in digesting wheat and, and milk. Those two proteins, casein and gluten that are so, we have so many people who have sensitivities to those proteins because the lactobacillus are being killed off by the glyphosate, then they, those proteins don't get properly digested. And then you have these peptide sequences from those proteins that cause um, immune cells to build antibodies. And that ends up being autoantibodies attacking your own tissues through this process of molecular mimicry where the sequence in the, the peptide sequence resembles a peptide sequence in a human protein. And that human protein gets attacked by mistake from the immune system. This is a classic autoimmune problem that is an epidemic today and it's causing all kinds of autoimmune diseases. How many uh, are, this might be a hard question to answer, but as you just stated, we're seeing uh, large numbers of people in our society who have these uh, are, are not tolerant um, with uh, uh, whether it be the, the milk from, you know, dairy products or uh, gluten and grains, how do you think uh, successful we would be if they change their diet of remediating that? Remediating yeah, that? I wish I knew, actually. I would, I would really hope that they could reverse it. And I just don't know enough about the immune system to know whether those antibodies would eventually sort of fade away because you know, when you create antibodies, they're sort of semi-permanent, I think. This is like with the vaccines, they induce, they, they make your immune cells produce these antibodies to the various antigens that are in the vaccines to make them work. And, but those antibodies can also become problematic with autoimmune disease. And I think that's why vaccines are associated with autoimmune disease. So it's a tricky uh, path to take when you make antibodies to a specific antigen your body is thinking that that's something toxic you need to watch out for. But once you've got those antibodies, they can go ahead and attack your tissues for as long as they exist. And I don't know how long it would take them to fade away mm -hmm. once that exposure was no longer there. But I would really hope that a person could switch to certified organic and then actually be able to go back to eating wheat. I would really hope that could be the case, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. So Sarah asked this question and maybe I'll, I'll, um, address this question to David, what is a safer non-selective herbicide? Mm. Oh, well, <clears throat> you know, it just depends on what species we're after and when we're spraying it, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, if we're going after, when I look at like glyphosate as a whole and your slide uh, with the super weeds, just paints a picture that there's so much weed resistance out there right now mm -hmm. to glyphosate that basically glyphosate's really good for grass control and that's about it. <laughs> there's a few <laughs> other broad leaves, but that list is, is pretty small. <laughs> Excuse me. That's interesting. I'm glad to know that. I think it's actually failing uh, in its role as a herbicide because of all this resistance that's coming about, which is actually good news to me because it might force us to get rid of it sooner. If it, if it doesn't have as much value, there's yeah. enough, less of a reason to use it. Yeah, there was a lot of overuse applications of it um, mm -hmm. just because of its effectiveness when the uh, Roundup Ready trait came out into the crops. Um, you know, when you look at other, you know, burn down herbicides and stuff like that, you know, if you're going in front of a, a corn or a grass crop, corn or sorghum or something, like that, um, and you were to use a, you know, um, clothodium, uh well, I can't speak right now, uh, like a select max would be a trademark name. Um, that herbicide, though, has some plant back restriction dates for going to corn or uh, mm. milo that a guy would have to really be cautious on. Um, you know, there's obviously gramoxone, but I wouldn't, you know, gramoxone is actually probably more deadly. It, it concerns me more than what glyphosate does. Mm -hmm. um, Do you know what it is in that? What active ingredient in gramoxone? Um, paraquat. paraquat. Oh, paraquat. Yeah, that's definitely toxic. <laughs> yeah. And of course, dicamba is getting four, used. Yeah, dicamba. you got two, four D and dicambas mm -hmm. out there as a non-selective, but they they're don't all really bad. do much they're for all bad. grass. So they're more of a broad leaf and 
Um, you know, is glufosinate being used at all? There, there is some, but uh, you know, it's probably not as wide use as what glyphosate has been. But if it became wide use, what effects might we see from that? I think a lot, actually, because it's actually exactly. an amino acid. It's an amino acid analog of glutamate, so it'll have the same problem glyphosate has, but with a different, different amino acid. Yeah. So for me, I mean, <laughs> especially in the more southern environments, um, you know, obviously, probably, I don't know, it's a broad statement to make, but I-80 South, maybe somewhere between I-80 and I-90, if you were to cut the U.S. in half there, um, using the cover crops with, um, you know, roller crimp or termination type mm. of thing to help, you know, suppress out weeds and using that to terminate your cover crop could be, mm -hmm. you know, one of the best ways to get away from a lot of herbicide use as well. That sounds fantastic uh, to me. Yeah, most guys, unfortunately, it's been driven into the, the minds that you don't ever want anything out in your fields. Um, so the retailers promote, you know, even, even guys that do some tillage, you'll do a fall herbicide program uh, with residuals to keep their fields clean come back in the springtime before the field starts to break with any type of weeds and spray another residual yeah. on that. And then come back again and 21 days later and spray another residual oh, uh, gotcha. right about planting time. And, and then maybe another shot of residual to get them through till fall to just have absolutely nothing else growing in that field, right. which isn't really that great either. That's terrible, actually, because you can even help climate change by growing these uh, cover crops. You know, you're, they're pulling carbon out of the air and putting it into the soil. Yeah, I mean, there's still those even even a, even a quote unquote weed is still feeding biology in the soil. Absolutely. It's still some cycling nutrients and improving the water cycle and everything else. So. Yeah, and it would yeah, certainly it would help, help soil, soil erosion, erosion, right, erosion. to have all that crop on there instead, instead of just bare dirt. dirt. Absolutely. OK, thank you, David. Don asks, are there any inexpensive ways to test for glyphosate in your own body? There are ways. They're not too inexpensive. I think it's around $100. Um, you can actually order something on the web and get a little kit and uh, mail back a frozen sample of urine and get a test that way. That's possible to do without ever going to a lab. Okay. Uh, as a person, you can do that. Um, that's uh, my labs for life, I think, is a place that uh, on the web that where you can do that or order up a glyphosate test. I, I see on the chat section that Sarah just posted HRI labs. Thank you, Sarah. OK, yeah. Jim asks, any studies on the use of rodeo in freshwater lakes to kill weeds? Uh, David, are you familiar with rodeo or Shane? I am not, no. I'm not either. Yeah. Uh -huh. What is, do you know what the active ingredient is in rodeo? I do not. We'll get yeah. David working on that right now while we ask <laughs> another question. <clears throat> yep. So here's a question. It says, uh, Dr. Snaff, it seems like you pr pretty much have a graph to correlate glyphosate to every known human ailment. <laughs> but aren't many of these illnesses multi-model with other or multiple underlying causes, such as nitrates, other antibiotics, mutagens, all contributing factors. So Absolutely. in other words, when has association or correlation been the same thing as causation? Right. And you yeah. touched on that briefly, but. Yeah, no, that's a criticism, but I think it, you know, the big question to, to turn, I would turn around and ask is why are all these diseases going up dramatically? That's not just something that just happens just because time passes. Something is causing them to go up. And I recognize that there are many, many new chemicals being introduced in our lives every day. And maybe all of them collectively together are just making this mess. But, you know, I, I think life is a it's, it's an open question, but it, from my studies, and if it is true that it's getting into the proteins, it goes a great way to, uh, ways towards explaining how it could cause each one of these diseases. I can find specific enzymes associated with each of these diseases 
that uh, I can predict would be affected by glyphosate in a way that would damage them and that would cause these diseases. In other words, it's a matter of connecting dots. It's not enough to say, oh, there's correlation, therefore it must be causal. But if you can dig into the biochemistry and the biophysics of what's going on, and you can show a causal path, and this is what happens with autism, there's multiple, multiple pathways by which, as I showed in the slides, you're seeing uh, all this happening in autism that's also happening in glyphosate exposure and experiments in vitro in, in animal studies. It's all fitting together into a giant puzzle that's falling into place. And so I think you, you can't just say by correlation alone, it's the cause. And it's obviously not the only cause. I'm not saying it's the only cause, but I think it is the primary cause of the epidemic in, yeah. in all of these diseases. Thank you for that. <clears throat> So we found out rodeo is glyphosate. Ah. <laughs> so so it's it's glyphosate being used for aquatic weeds. Mm, so being water soluble. <laughs> uh, yes. That's not good. <laughs> that's very problematic. And as I showed, it goes into the biofilms and concentrates there. So that's going to affect all the animals that are hanging out in the biofilms in the waterways. Mm -hmm. And you know, potentially drink in our drinking water, et cetera. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And you know, the manatees in Florida, I wrote a little story about that, uh, published it, uh, an article. And um, it's, uh, the manatees are in really big trouble in Florida and um, they're dying in record numbers this year. And, um, and I think glyphosate's a major player in that. Hmm. Next question from our friend, Willie. Willie asks, in what gaseous form is the glyphosate released into the atmosphere from biofuel produced from GMO corn sprayed with glyphosate? In what gaseous form? It's just glyphosate as a gas. It's, it's, it's evaporating, uh, is my theory. <laughs> as I said, it's just a theory, but uh, it, needs, it needs support. Although it, it has some support from the study in Brazil that showed glyphosate in the, in, in the nanoparticles. So it is definitely in the air. And there have been other studies that have shown that it, sh it shows up in the rain. So it's being picked up in the atmosphere from the rain. So it's clearly up there in the air. So I think it, 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 I think it can evapor evaporate, um, apparently. So again, I'm not saying it's proven, but it's, I'd like for people to take a look. Chemists who have the ability to do this sort of thing should take a look. Well, that, that would make sense because we just saw released a study that of, I believe it was 100 organic farms, and they found some traces of glyphosate on all of them. Yeah, there you and go. And so it, 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 <clears throat> it would make sense that it was airborne. And, and it's a small molecule. The, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. Dr. Staneff, I want to thank you very much for this excellent presentation this evening. And if you would hold up your book again so everybody okay, can I'll see it. <laughs> there we go. There it is. Toxic yeah. Legacy coming out the 1st of, of uh, July. Yeah. So we look forward to reading that. And we thank you very much for your time. Uh, we ask our attendees to, to uh, look at our website and pay attention to the upcoming webinars. And we look forward with, to visiting with all of you then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Seneff. Good evening. Bye-bye.